I'm sure most of our audience, certainly outside the metropolitan area, have never heard of the city of New Rochelle. Now it's become an epicenter of the coronavirus after an attorney with deep ties to that city's Orthodox Jewish community contracted it and unknowingly spread it. That was from RFL last year, and until last spring, most people only knew the city of New Rochelle, New York, as the home of the Petries, the fictional couple played by Dick Van Dyke and Mary Tyler Moore on the old Dick Van Dyke show. But all that changed after a man from that city that's only 20 miles north of Midtown Manhattan became the second person in the state to be diagnosed with COVID. The first case was a healthcare worker in New York City who had traveled abroad and caught the virus outside of the United States. Soon after, a containment zone was set up and the National Guard was called in to help clean and sanitize public spaces and hand out food and water to those who needed it. And since the man who started it all, known as Patient Zero, attended a temple in New Rochelle and also traveled into New York City for work, he was in contact with a number of people who were also in contact with many more people. So the ripple effect was huge. People from as far away as Baltimore and New Jersey had to quarantine because they had also attended events at that temple, not to mention the caterers and other people who were also exposed. So how is New Rochelle doing one year later? For that, we turn to the man who runs New Rochelle, Mayor Noam Bramson. Mr. Mayor, we're now more than a year out from the start of the COVID cluster in New Rochelle. One year later, how close to normal is life in New Rochelle for residents and for their mayor? Well, I think it's about the same here as it is everywhere else. Uh, we've all experienced uh, disruptions in our lives of a kind that would have been unimaginable before the, the pandemic began. began. Um, now, there is light at the end of the tunnel, fortunately. We know the vaccine is here. It's safe and effective. Supplies are ramping up. And so I think it's, it's reasonable for us to have a, a sense of hope that by the time uh, we get further into 2021, uh, normal life will, will begin to resume. Uh, but for now, we're still in that tunnel, and we still have to be careful, and we still have to uh, abide by the new normal that we've all gotten used to over these last few months. Looking back, do you recall your first reactions when you first heard about the breakout last year? And, and I'm curious, as time went on, what were the big fears that went through your head, and was there a worst moment for you? Yeah, you know, the first I heard about the uh, the outbreak in New Rochelle was a call from a colleague in New York City government. Uh, you may recall that the index patient worked in New York City, lived in New Rochelle, so there was kind of shared responsibility. Uh, prior to that moment, uh, like most Americans, I, I was aware of the coronavirus. I knew it was a major issue uh, in the Far East and, uh, and in Italy. Uh, and I understood intellectually that it could come to the United States and be a problem here, but it still seemed very remote. And then suddenly there it was right in our own community. And it was immediately apparent uh, that uh, life in our little corner of the world was going to change dramatically. And of course, uh, the rest of the, uh, the country would follow shortly thereafter. Um, but even at that moment, even recognizing the gravity of what we were facing, I don't think I, I fully grasp just what kind of duration uh, the pandemic would have and just how um, comprehensively disruptive it would be to almost every aspect of life. Uh, that, that was knowledge that was acquired through sort of painful experience uh, in the days that followed. Uh, in terms of the, the darkest moment, uh, I remember very vividly a, a conversation with the city manager early on in which we talked together about uh, a series of worst case scenarios. Uh, what will we do if uh, essential supply chains break down? What will we do if there are food riots? What will we do if there's civil unrest? What will we do if the virus sweeps through our essential workforce? Um, thank goodness none of those worst case scenarios came to pass as bad as it was. Uh, we didn't face any of those uh, particular circumstances, but the fact that we even had to have a conversation like that that we had to contemplate a breakdown of that kind, I think is an illustration of just how dark an experience it was. How did residents respond to the outbreak, both in terms of their own efforts to help those who fell ill or the families of those who passed away or, or just people who contracted the virus, but also in terms of preventative behavior, masking up and social distancing and following the restrictions? Did, did the experience in New Rochelle bring extra motivation to the people of New Rochelle? I think it did. And uh, if there is a, a silver lining in such a dark and, and painful year, 
It's the resilience and strength that it's demonstrated in our community and in many other communities. Uh, I remember in those early days and then con continuing throughout, uh, the really remarkable heroic um, uh, service of not-for-profit organizations, uh, the volunteers who came out of the woodwork to uh, assist their neighbors, uh, uh, the, the work of civil servants who were able to sort of carry on in a significantly disrupted work environment, uh, the way that our business community responded in an innovative way uh, to a completely changed landscape, uh, developers who made significant financial contributions uh, to the common good, um, and, and beyond that, just the kind of sense of calm maturity with which the people of our city generally uh, dealt with this public health emergency. There was never any panic. There was never any irrational fear. There was no turning on each other. Uh, there was a spirit of, of common purpose and uh, a sense of seriousness that we recognized this was a big challenge, but we were going to face it together. Um, and I think that's held throughout. I mean, for the most part, uh, people have adhered to those public health guidelines. They've worn masks. They've kept their distance. Uh, to the extent that people don't do it, it's almost always because of forgetfulness or fatigue, not sort of an, an intentional effort to, uh, to defy public health authorities. Um, so I'm proud of uh, the strength that New Rochelle has demonstrated. No one would ever want to go through an experience like this, but uh, sometimes it's only when you're tested that you really find out what you're made of. And uh, New Rochelle, I think, has risen to the occasion. What about the vaccines? Is the New Rochelle experience leading to greater acceptance, greater uh, desire for the vaccine in New Rochelle, or are the numbers about what you're seeing in other places? Uh, I, my sense is it's about what we're seeing in other places. And at this moment, uh, it's still more of a supply challenge than a demand challenge. There are more people who want the vaccine than are able to get it. I think we all expect that that's going to flip sometime pretty soon uh, as vaccine supplies ramp up, as more people complete their course of vaccination, uh, and then we'll become increasingly concerned about vaccine hesitancy and access. And, and that's got to be a multi-pronged effort. Everyone from the national government to local government uh, to people in the uh, healthcare community, uh, uh, people in uh, communities of faith, uh, anyone who's in a position to uh, speak to folks and be trusted, um, I think really needs to speak out strongly about uh, how all of us have a stake individually for our families and for our communities in making sure that we get vaccinated. It's really the only way to finally put this nightmare behind us and, uh, and get back to normal life. Finally, Mr. Mayor, one year later, any mistakes or regrets that come to mind either from any of your actions amid the worst of the outbreak or from any aspect of the response that followed? Oh, yeah. I mean, look, um, it's been a learning experience for all of us. And I think um, with with very few exceptions uh, in those early days, I think many people in government, many people in the public health community did not have a, a firm grasp uh, of exactly what was occurring and what was going to unfold in the weeks ahead. I mean, New Rochelle is probably best known nationwide for the containment zone, uh, which was imposed just a few days after our, our first case. Uh, and in retrospect, that whole concept seems flawed. It, it was based on the notion that we had an isolated outbreak and by um, focusing our attention here, we could prevent it from spreading elsewhere, almost like a kitchen fire that you can knock down with a hand extinguisher. Well, in retrospect, we know that there were already about 10,000 undetected cases throughout the New York metropolitan area. So any strategy that was focused specifically on New Rochelle had no chance whatsoever of succeeding. Um, but I, look, I don't say this in a critical mode. I think everyone at that time was doing the best they could based on the information available to them. And um, you have to be able to course correct uh, in, in the course of a crisis um, in order to accommodate whatever the latest and best information is. So I... I, I I'm overall impressed by how um, officials at the state and county and local level handled this, but there certainly were mistakes along the road. Noam Bramson is the Democratic mayor of New Rochelle, New York. Mr. Mayor, it is always a pleasure, my friend. Thanks very much. Glad to be with you, Andrew. And up next, the one thing that can either stall the Democrats' agenda or clear the road to get it through Congress. After the break, I'll explain.